Well, I don't know about you, but horses really amaze me. Their sheer size and strength uh, is pretty incredible. Um, Some have called the dog man's best friend. Others of you prefer cats. Uh, But there's a good argument to be made that the horse in in much of human history has been uh, very important to us as humans, right? So so much so we still uh, refer to power with horsepower, right? I was reading the other day about draft horses, very massive animals, very powerful animals. And it's hard to imagine, but a draft horse can pull a load of up to 8,000 pounds. 8,000 pounds. But where it gets really crazy, and some of you have heard this before, if you put two draft horses together, you would think, simple math, right? 8,000 plus 8,000, 16,000. But actually, when you put two of these horses together, they can do three times the work. So they can do 24,000 pounds of uh, pull that, that kind of load. And if these horses have trained together, they can actually do four times as much, 32,000 pounds. If they've trained together, learned together, and, and, and done this work together. So 8,000 pounds alone, 32,000 pounds together. And we see this principle in sports, in business, in the military. People are exponentially better together. And that's the title of today's teaching, Better Together. For a while now, we've been studying the life of the ancient guy named Paul. We've been following his life through the book of Acts. And sometimes Paul seems like a solo missionary. Kind of this type A, task-oriented, lone-ranging, butt-kicking, bulldozer for the gospel. But that really isn't true. He's definitely a bulldozer. He could definitely be type A sometimes, but he never did it alone. He always pulled with other people. And the first time I noticed this, I was reading through the book of Romans, and I got to the end of the book, chapter 16, and I ran into a number of names. Now, you know, that that riveting reading everybody enjoys, you know, the names at the end of the book. No, like you actually skip that part, right, typically, and I get it, but this time I decided not to skip the names. I decided to read through them, and I realized something, that these are real people, real people, Paul's friends. And I'm going to give you a sense of how many people are on this list. And so as I struggle through these names, I'm expecting a round of applause afterwards, okay? (laughs) Verse 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ. They risk their lives for me. Greet the church that meets in their home. Greet my dear friend, Apenetus, who is the first convert to Christ in Asia. Greet Mary. Greet Andronicus and Junia, who've been in prison with me. Greet Ampelatus. My dear friend in the Lord, greet Urbanus, our co-worker in Christ, and my dear friend Strachus. Greet Apelles, whose fidelity to Christ has stood the test. Greet the household of Aristobulus. Greet Herodian, my fellow Jew. Greet those in the household of Narcissus. That's kind of a funny one. <laughs> greet Trophina and Trophosa, those women who worked hard in the Lord. I'm glad that he tells us these are men and women because it can get confusing. Gr- greet my dear friend Persis. Another woman who's worked hard in the Lord. Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother, who's been a mother to me too. Greet Asyncretus, Philegion, Hermes, Patrobus, Hermas, and the other brothers and sisters with them. Greet Philologus, Julia, Neresis, and her sister Olympus, and all the Lord's people who are with them. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the churches of Christ send greetings. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, no money. Please, no money. Uh, (laughs) this list of Greek and Roman names doesn't mean much to us, but they meant everything to Paul. In fact, I might suggest that without some of these people, Paul wouldn't have made it. He would have quit. He might have been, uh, he might have succumbed to depression. He might have met an earlier death. Today we're going to blaze through Acts 18 and 19 And in this, Paul finishes his second missionary journey. It would have been about 3,000 miles, 100 days of travel time alone. I've got a little map here. It'd be like traveling from here to New York City without a plane or a a vehicle. I did a similar uh, trip in distance, not in time, uh, to the East Coast to go to Austin's wedding. We had a good time over there. Um, 
you know, and on this trip, I picked up some sort of bug in Washington, D.C. It was probably all the politicians, you know. I came back with a kind of a cold, and then somehow I got poison ivy in Ohio. I'm just a magnet for poison oak and poison ivy. And somehow, you know, and then I come back and it's all smoky. My life is so hard. <laughs> but Paul, to a far greater extent, picks up a lot of stuff on this trip. In fact, he becomes a magnet of misery on this trip, on this second missionary journey. This trip just destroys him. In Acts 15, for starters, the trip starts with a disagreement between Paul and his best friend Barnabas. They simply can't agree if they should bring John Mark on the trip and they separate. So it kind of leaves a sour taste in their mouth right at the beginning of the trip. In Acts 16, Paul goes towards Asia, but nothing seems to work out. Opportunities keep closing down. They're wasting time traveling all over the place in modern day Turkey. They're on the far right of this screen up, screen up there by Troas. Finally, they enter Philippi. But there they're falsely accused. They help this young girl out, but they're falsely accused, severely beaten, illegally flogged, and thrown into prison. They finally get out, Acts 17. They go to Thessalonica. There the religious leaders venomously stir up a riot, forcing Paul and his team to escape at night. They then go to Berea, which actually goes pretty well, till the Thessalonians make the 50-mile trip to uh, stop Paul. He's forced to leave again. He goes to Athens. They're at the bottom of the screen there. He preaches an amazing sermon. The response, though, is kind of a yawning indifference. Slightly interested in Paul's message, only as much as he's the flavor of the day. There's only a few converts. He then travels to Corinth. And he'd later tell the Corinthian church this when he showed up. I came to you in weakness. With great fear and trembling. He's weak. He's beat up in more ways than one. Chewed up and spit out. Totally spent physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually. Have you ever been there? How did Paul make it through this difficult time? Well, one of these things kept standing out to me as I read this passage. Names. Names. People. Some of these boring names have big implications. So big idea today. In every category, we are better in community. In every category, we're better in community. The problem, one of my main impulses, if I can be real, is isolation. Especially when I'm tired or in pain or needing to get stuff done. And I don't think I'm alone in that. More and more, I'm seeing uh, this phenomenon. I don't know if you guys have seen this much in your life. Right? And I'm talking about headphones if you're listening online or if you're listening through headphones. Trippy. Right? <laughs> That's weird. Headphones are amazing in that we don't need to listen to someone play their music on their iPhone speaker. Uh, they're amazing when you're on the airplane and there's a shrieking baby. Uh, but I think the growing prominence of headphones is reflecting something in our culture. Namely, the increase in isolation individualism, and self-centeredness. More and more, to my shame, I'm finding that sometimes I'd rather drive alone, exercise alone, right? Uh, work alone, even eat alone, because it's easier, and because it's faster, more efficient, more predictable, less messy, except the eating part, you know? It's probably more mess, uh, messy alone. But uh, Paul's story that we're going to talk about challenges my American individualism and headphone Christianity. Acts 18.1, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come to Italy, from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all of the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them because he was a tent maker as they were. He stayed and worked with them. So if you're taking notes, the first thing we see here is uh, we are better in community for support. Support. And by support, I mean healing, strengthening, restoration, rehabilitation, recovery. Paul walks into Corinth very weak and very afraid. That's his own words. If he was like me, he might have found a hole to hide in for a few years. 
But instead, God brings him in contact with an incredible couple, Priscilla and Aquila. There is, Pastor Chuck likes to say, a dynamic duo. Or we think of uh, some of our own dynamic duos, uh, you know, the Criswells here and uh, Tim and Terry, you know. Uh, just the, these husband-wife ministry teams. And, and Priscilla and Aquila are the only ones mentioned in Acts in the Letters. Of the six times they're mentioned, Priscilla's name is mentioned first four times, which means she probably came from a higher social class. In fact, some scholars even think Aquila was a Jewish slave who secured his freedom before he married Priscilla. So Paul meets this couple through work. They invite him to come live with them, and they soon become some of his closest friends. And it's in their house that Paul begins to regain his strength and confidence and passion. One night, crashing on their couch, Paul has this vision of of God in a dream. And God says this to Paul, do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. No one is going to attack you and harm you because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Little side note, what a privilege it is for God to use your space to speak to someone's suffering for God to use your couch your living room your kitchen your car anywhere that's your space that you open up for someone else for God to speak directly to someone in their situation in their house God tells him Paul don't be afraid I have many Christians in this city there's so much support here Paul you're not alone It reminds some of us of the prophet Elijah in the Old Testament. He's just pulled off this incredible prophetic prophetic feat, maybe the greatest feat in prophetic history. He calls down fire from heaven in front of the country, the whole country. He then, it's him versus 850 false prophets. He then leads a rebellion and kills all of the 850 false prophets. But then the queen wants to kill him. And for some reason, he gets very depressed and afraid and scared after all he's seen and heard. And so he kind of whines to God. He says, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, tore down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left. And now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. Go to the desert of Damascus. Verse 18, I reserve 7,000 in Israel whose knees have not bowed down to Baal and whose mouths have not kissed him. In other words, Elijah cries, God, I'm all alone. And then God replies, dude, go to Damascus. And by the way, you're not alone. There's 7,000 of you, you big baby. You know, that's my translation. Yeah, God's nicer than I am. Uh, But honestly, how often do we feel alone, isolated, lonely? We think we're the only one facing this or that. We might complain like Elijah, God, I'm the only Christian in my class, in my family. I'm the only Christian in my friend group or at work. God, I'm the only one facing these unwanted attractions. God, I'm the only person at my high school not having premarital sex. God, I'm the only person who seems to care about social justice and some of these things. I'm the only person dealing with addiction and struggle. And God tells Elijah and Paul and every one of us here, no, you're not alone. I have many people in this city. Many people who have not. uh, I have many people at your school. I have many people in this situation. Many people who have not bowed down and kissed the idols of the culture. You are not alone. Paul gets invited to live with Priscilla and Aquila, but don't miss that they're co-workers as well. So if you're taking notes, we're also better at work. Better at work. The initial contact point for these three people is the trade of tent making. Tents were made out of goat's hair or leather. Jewish rabbis or teachers like Paul, like Jesus, would have actually been expected to know a trade, to be bivocational, to work and make money as to not Uh, rely on other people too much on Saturday these three people Paul Priscilla Aquila they would rest and they would go to the synagogue for worship for uh, Bible talk and prayers on Sunday they'd start working again 
But in the evening, they would have church, which would be more like life group in their home. And they'd have communion together, which is what we're going to do today in the service. And then Monday through Friday, these three would tirelessly work with tents. They'd make money to provide for themselves. I guess for us, how might God want to connect you more closely with your Christian co-workers? Do you know them? Are you able to meet together, talk together, intentionally work together? It's incredible to think how many spheres of influence are represented in this room for our city, the city that we love, the city that we're in for. Even if you don't like your job or don't like your schooling, right? even if you wish you were somewhere else, how might God be at work in your place of employment? As one old friend said, uh, as he was talking about a job or life situation, if you can't get out of it, get into it. If you can't get out of it, get into it because everyone needs to work, but more importantly, God's already at work. Third, we're better together for ministry or in ministry. We see this in financial partnerships. Verse five, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. So we get some more names, Silas and Timothy. They're co-workers of Paul. They show up and they probably have some money. Not because they're rich, because, but because churches at Philippi supported them. So this allows Paul to take a break in making tents and to go Monday through Friday, or actually every day, uh, and, and to devote himself to a full-time preaching ministry. And we see this financial help in chapter 19 as well, as Paul goes to the city of Ephesus. It says, he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them. He took the disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. This went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. <clears throat> wow, that's incredible. But the idea here, um, things don't work out for Paul in the synagogue. He gets kicked out or he leaves. So he starts using a secular or a pagan a lecture hall. Someone's got to foot the bill. And it might have been Tyrannus himself as a new convert. It probably wasn't Paul. And we see this today as well. Because so many of you give generously, River Valley. I know that I'm here. I'm able to work uh, full time. Able to devote more time to study, to prayer, to preaching, to community involvement. Uh, to meeting with people because of you. And I know I, I'm super thankful for it, and I speak for a lot of the pastors here who are. Because you give, over a 1,000 orphans in Uganda are supported with food, medical supplies, and school uh, fees. Organizations like the Pregnancy Care Center and the Mission in town thrive off your support. All this to say, when we sacrificially and intentionally give, our influence is exponential, exponentially extended. And this doesn't mean we just give and don't have to serve ourselves or speak ourselves, but it's a huge part of it. Financial support empowers others. Why is this? Well, because when people are more able to focus exclusively on their God-given gifts and passions, then they're able to really thrive in that spot. In that gifting, and incredible things can happen. I don't know that this is replicable, but check out what God does through Paul in Acts 19.11. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick, and their illnesses were cured, and the evil spirits left them. Wow. That kind of resembles Jesus. Remember the woman who just said, if I can just touch his garment, I'll be, I'll be healed. Now, I know God can do whatever he wants. I don't know if this is something we should expect today, but the, the point of this is that other people empowered Paul so he could use his God-given gifts. And God even did more through him and in him because the Philippians gave. Well, fourth, we're better by correction. This one's hard sometimes. So Paul moves to Ephesus. So do Priscilla and Aquila. They go together uh, eventually. There they meet a man named Apollos. And here's what Luke tells us about this encounter. 
Meanwhile, Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, although he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. So Apollos is a curious character. Some think he might have even been the author of the book of Hebrews. So you can read on that a little bit. He comes from Egypt, Alexandria, which will one day be a Christian powerhouse. Uh, He's a gifted, passionate teacher. And he teaches about Jesus. And it says even accurately about Jesus. But the one problem, Luke says, is Apollos only knew about the baptism of John. We don't know exactly what that means. But it just seems like Apollos doesn't have the full story. He doesn't know the full story about Jesus. His teaching is not necessarily inaccurate. It's incomplete. It's like having, just having appetizers and not having the full meal. Priscilla and Aquila invite Apollos into their home like they did with Paul. They have him over to dinner. Right? And they share with him the rest of the story. Filling in the gaps in Apollos' teaching. This requires both a gentle boldness from them, it's hard to do sometimes, and a receptive humility from Apollos. It seems like both people had these uh, qualities. It's hard to be corrected, but Apollos seems to receive it, and he's better for it. Verse 27, when Apollos wanted to go to Achaia, the brothers and sisters encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there to welcome him, for when he arrived, he was a great help. To those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted his Jewish opponents in public debate, proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Messiah. It reminds me of Proverbs 27 6. Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That's a great image, right? Kisses are far more comfortable, but wounds from a friend are trustworthy, necessary, important. Do you have friends that you trust enough to wound you for your good? To hurt your pride, my pride, and bad habits and sin patterns? Are you a friend who's willing to do that to those in your life? Right? To, to those around you, to wound someone else for their good? Or are we just going to walk around kissing everybody? Kind of a weird image, you know, but it's being comfortable. Never really wanting to rock the boat and offend or ostracize. It's like a surgeon cutting out cancer. Are we the kind of friend that can boldly and gently cut those around us? Not on Twitter. Probably not through texting. Definitely not in public. Or probably not in public. But in the context of personal, private relationship. There's another instance of correction in chapter 19. Paul correct some disciples similar to Apollos 19.1. When Apollos went, was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked them, what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Jesus said, uh, Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that's Jesus, On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So Paul corrects these disciples who've not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Like Apollos, they're only familiar with John's baptism, which probably means they understand repentance but not grace. They're not necessarily Christians yet. But Paul shows up, explains the good news to them. They're baptized in Jesus' name, and the Holy Spirit enters them. When we think about correction, there's kind of a funny story that happens right afterwards. It's a more serious spiritual correction. Verse 13, 19, 13. Some Jews went around driving out evil spirits and tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. They would say, in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a Jewish high priest, were doing this. One day the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. 
I mean, you could just picture Luke laughing as he writes this, right? Wow, it's ironic and slightly funny if the situation wasn't so serious. Right? These seven sons of Sceva, sounds like a disease, you know, but uh, <clears throat> names. They're shamefully corrected uh, by a demon-possessed man. Their flippant, unbelieving posture towards Jesus, kind of seeing him as a magic incantation or a lucky rabbit's foot, that's not going to fly. This is a cosmic battle that they're in in Ephesus. And these guys are playing card games. So the demon sets them straight. Pretty funny. What happens? Verse 17, while, uh, when this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear. And the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they'd done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the, Lord, the word of the Lord spread and grew in power. So these new Christians have a book-burning party. Or a scroll burning party. Probably hundreds of thousands of dollars in sorcery scrolls. They decide together in community that this stuff is harmful to their lives and to their faith. Now I'm not saying you got to go burn your Justin Bieber tracks or Lady Gaga tracks, you know. Although, strictly from a musical perspective, it's not a bad idea. <laughs> but, but, but correction in our lives often involves cutting, removing, the burning away of things that are going to hold us back, especially in the area of media and entertainment. We're far too uncritical about the stuff we allow into our lives. Well, fifth and finally, we're better with wise counsel. Oh, actually, there's six, not finally. We'll move through this quickly. Wise counsel. All this work in Ephesus causes quite the stir, and it some bad stuff starts with a silversmith named Demetrius. I told you there were a lot of names. He makes little idols of Artemis, who is the kind of the main god of that area. And he starts losing profits, as you can imagine. He starts losing money when everyone starts to worship Jesus, who's invisible uh, and not Artemis. So he stirs up a mob and a dangerous riot commences. Soon the whole city was in uproar. The people seize Gaius and Aristarchus. Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples would not let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent a message begging him not to venture into the theater. I've got a picture of the Ephesus theater. Uh, it's, it's remarkably well preserved today. Pretty cool. And it could hold, this isn't the rogue theater, okay? Uh, this could hold 20,000 people. This is a terrifying mob here. Verse 32. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most of the people did not know even why they were there. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front and shouted instructions to them. He motioned for silence in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Two-hour chant by this mob. Paul wants to go speak to the group, but it's not a good time. The disciples and his friends beg him not to go out to the mob. And Paul seems to listen to them. That or they're just physically restraining him, holding him back. Friends don't let friends go in front of 20,000 groups of irate individuals, right? You know, you hold them back. Chapter 19 ends with the city clerk, the most powerful Ephesian official, scolding the crowd. Everyone chills out. And remarkably, everyone goes home unhurt that night. Looking back, Paul would shed some light on his condition in Ephesus. Many scholars think he's referring to Ephesus here in 2 Corinthians 1.9. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experience in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. In his first Corinthians, he says this, I face death every day. Yes, as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus, our Lord. If I fought with wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? In both Corinth and Ephesus, Paul's pain and his pressures drove him towards people. Not away in isolation. Paul 
pressed in, like those draft horses we talked about in the beginning, Paul hitched himself to other people, to great people, and continued in perseverance. And so tonight, in what ways do you feel lonely or isolated? Maybe it's intentional, maybe not protecting yourself from others. Maybe you've been hurt and you've been unwilling to open up to others. How might God be challenging you today to reopen, to get connected? Life groups are starting very soon, right? Fall is approaching. Will you make community and church and groups a priority? Well, six and finally, we're better as friends of God. I'm going to invite the worship team back up. But remember that dream, that vision that Paul had on Aquila's couch where God said to him, don't be afraid, Paul. I am with you. I'm with you. That's huge. God's peace and his presence. God's own friendship. James 2, 23, and scripture was fulfilled that said Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness and he was called God's friend. Jesus tells us greater love is no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You're my friends if, I, if you do what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know the master's business. Indeed, instead, I've called you friends. For everything I've learned from my father, I've made known to you. You know, unfortunately, with the word friend, it can kind of communicate acquaintance today. Right? There's a lot of Facebook friends on my Facebook that I don't know. It's just an acquaintance. But Jesus says that he shares everything with his friends. He's always with us. He permanently binds himself to us. It's an incredible privilege to be called a friend of God. Especially when we didn't start there. And like Abraham, we can become friends of God simply through believing in Jesus. Through opening up to him through friendship with him. God makes his enemies his friends. And that's where all of us were, enemies of God. God makes his enemies his family. We're going to enter into a time of communion and, and, and we're going to act this out. It's almost, it's this ritual called communion and it, it's, it's where we kind of with visible signs and, and symbols, we, we see that God invites us to his table invites us to his family. We think of Priscilla and Aquila constantly inviting people to their table and how God does the same to us and gives us communion, something we celebrate monthly here at River Valley to be reminded that we are invited to his table. So if you don't know God, if you don't have a friendship with God, I invite you to come talk to someone afterwards. But right now, would the ushers come as we pass out the elements to take communion? And if you hold on to them, we'll take it all together in a few moments.